Imagine a new kind of investing, a potentially life-changing way to invest that honors biblical principles, the kind of principles that you and I grew up with. Since 1994, Timothy Plan has made biblically responsible investing possible, offering mutual funds and ETFs that are filtered for biblical principles. Don't compromise your values. Invest with Timothy Plan. Ask your financial advisor or call Timothy Plan at 1-800-TIM-PLAN. Again, that's 1-800-846-7526 and discover what it means to be a biblically responsible investor. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. Mutual funds distributed by Timothy Partners, LTD, and ETFs distributed by Foresight Fund Services, LLC. As a paid testimonial, there is no guarantee of future performance, and each experience will differ. Hey there, welcome to another Memo Pod. I'm glad that you made time for us. Glad that you are with us, either audibly, because you're listening to the podcast, or visually, because you're watching the uh, stream of it here uh, through YouTube and uh, through the Substack, the email that comes out to all of you. But great to have you with us. Hope that you have all, free subscribers, paid subscribers, that you have checked the new website, peterheck.com, if you go there. There's uh, some of it that still looks the same, uh, but we have, uh, we've rearranged things and kind of redone some things so that it's one, more user-friendly, and number two, is more pleasing to the eye, particularly for those of you, the vast majority of you now, who look at websites and go online on your phones. So we've kind of transitioned from more of a desktop model to a phone model of, uh, of website development. And so you can check that out. It's, it's um, hopefully going to house some neat things that are coming up in the future, which by the way, I got an email from a couple of you. Yes, the second presidential debate for Republicans was on Wednesday. Yes, we are still part of the website redo is building a secure location online where we can invite you, our paid subscribers in uh, for a live chat during the presidential debates. I'm very anxious about this. My intent, obviously, all along has been for the general election, when you've got the Republican versus the Democrat. But I'm hopeful we'll have like a beta version that we can run. Uh, for those of you that aren't into computer lingo, that's like a uh, that's like a soft opening. Like where they... It's not the grand opening yet, but they're still going to do it to work the kinks out and things like that. Yeah, so I want to do that, hopefully during the Republican primaries, and there will be, uh, there'll be more debates coming, a chance, a chance for all of that. But I'm excited about it. It's going to be one of the neat things. I think I've told you before that I used to do that with my, well, at the time, now it's a college level, now it's Ball State government that I, that I teach at my high school, but it used to be AP government, and I would have my AP government classes. We would all get online into a private chat room that I would have established through the school and they could sign in and then we would watch the debates and comment and talk about it. It got the kids watching the debates and talking about it. And that's what I wanted to, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I have since stopped doing that because of the uh, intense polarization that has happened and just the way everybody operates. It's, uh, uh, you don't want kids feeling ostracized and things like that. And there's a tendency for that to happen or demonized even. It's just the the fun has kind of gone out of it. Maybe we'll get back there, but I know it'll work in a community like ours. So if you're a paid subscriber, all of that is coming up. Now, those of you who are free subscribers, I'm certainly glad to have you and certainly want to make the case. One of the reasons that I've been sending more in terms of the memo previews uh, to you is so that um, you can see what it is that we do and maybe decide this is this is a community I want to be a part of. These are like-minded believers, and we're learning how to see things through the eyes of faith. That's my objective. It's my goal. Uh, somebody had asked me in the comment section last week, you know, is this, are you just creating content to get paid, or are you trying to, to motivate godly people? And, uh, I mean, at first my thought was, well, both, I guess, uh, because I do believe that it is a calling, not necessarily my calling, but it is a calling and it is a, a great privilege to try to encourage believers who are living in a hostile culture, which we certainly are. Encourage believers. It's not, it's not a hostile culture for cultural Christians, for compromising Christians. 
There are a lot of people that wear the name of Jesus who are very comfortable and their churches are, are well attended and they have a great deal of money and all of that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about faithful allegiance to the authority of God's word. That's going to cost you something. And because we're living in a culture that's hostile to that. And so, um, yeah, I, I want to encourage those people. I want to um, us to sharpen iron, sharpening iron. That's one of the things I really, really crave in this community that we're building. Um, yeah, but time is money. And so we've offered that paid subscription option for folks that believe in what we're doing and want to be a part of what we're doing and um, to also share comments. Like like last week, I think I shared, it was in a column for Not the Bee, that one of our paid subscribers kind of pushed back against something I had said in the 9-11 um, and, and talking about 9-11 and whether the terrorists won and all of that, it was really good. It was eye-opening uh, for me, and it was good for me to think about. None of us has a singular corner on truth, and so that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. I've got my own passions and desires, not relative to 9-11, but I've got my own passions and desires, and they will sometimes cloud my judgment and my thinking and my vision, and I need fellow believers to kind of set me straight. Um, and so... That's the value that I see in all of this and why I'm thrilled that so many of you who are paid subscribers have joined. Would love to see the rest of you who are free uh, join in as well. But certainly I understand there's a million things to spend money on and money is tight. And if it's not something that you see as, as edifying uh, to your walk, eh, there's better things to do then. And it's, it's totally good. Um, but anyway, so today on the Memo Pod... A uh, couple things that I want to cover. First of all, for everybody, for our, for our free and paid subscribers, I've got something for you. And I don't, I may be wrong here. And I'll, I'll even say I'm wrong often. But I watched this recent exchange that happened on Comedy Central's The Daily Show. Remember, that's the old show that Jon Stewart used to be on and then he left. And now they've got a guy, Trevor Noah, who's trying so desperately to hang on to his accent. If you've ever watched him, he's really, really trying. Like, undoubtedly has tutors and people that he practices it with to hold on to it. I'm not calling him fake or a phony. I'm just saying when you live among Americans for an extended period of time, you will develop that style of talking. There was a minister in my area who was from Great Britain. He was from Britain and he had the British accent. But he told me that he took classes to keep the British accent because he wanted to keep the British accent. He was proud of it. Um, it was unique. And I think that's what Trevor Noah's doing. I can't prove it, but I think it's got to be what he's doing if you listen to him. But I saw this clip uh, that I'm going to play for you here in just a second. And I have become convinced that there is a growing number of entertainers and stars and commentators from the left, from the far left, who are realizing that they've gone too far. I'm going to play this for you, and I want you to tell me that you don't see written all over no Trevor Noah's face, and in the sound of his voice that you don't hear, we're really up a creek now. We've really gone too far now, and I don't know how to make our way back. I'm truly convinced that's where we are. I'll play this for you in just a minute. For those of you who are paid subscribers, uh, I'm going to dig into something that I played this audio and video for you of Barack Obama speaking to young people. And I don't know how to say this delicately, but it's just tragic what he's saying. It's like the worst advice young people could ever be given is what Barack Obama said. And I know people are going to say, oh, you're just an Obama hater. No, I always had issues with Barack Obama and um, I, I thought that a lot of people fell for a lot of nonsense, but it's not, a, it's not a personal thing. It's really not. I just think that this is terrible, awful, horrific advice. I'll get into that in the second half. But let me start here. Uh, this is the video. This is the exchange. You have Trevor Noah, who's sitting here, the host of The Daily Show, and he has on, and I don't have the name... Uh, but a, a a transgender activist, okay? Transgender activist, a male who's pretending to be a female, all right? 
sitting there and they're having this discussion. And part of this, as you watch it, is to sit there and say, how are we to this point? Ten years ago, we would have laughed at the notion that we would be at this point, And yet here we are. But as you watch this, I want you to try to get beyond that. And I want you to see if you see it on Trevor Noah's face. And if you hear it in Tre Trevor Noah's voice, we've gone too far with this. We're now in league with the crazies. And that isn't good. Take a look. This issue, people like to say that it's a complicated issue, and I don't actually think it is. I think it's very simple. It all boils down to, do you actually think that trans women and intersex women are real women and are really female mm -hmm. or not? And if you do, it's very simple. Just stop policing who counts as a real woman because this has had history of racism built into it over the years. It's not an accident that the intersex athletes who get singled out are women of color from the global south because who gets singled out for scrutiny is based on white women's conceptions of femininity. And that's being weaponized against trans people too. So it's a fear of protecting the fragile, weak, cis white woman from the rest of us. So, so. There are many elements to what you said, which I appreciate. So let, let's try break them down. One thing that confuses me personally is it, it, it seems like we have discussions about who should participate in which category and how. You know, on the face of it, it seems simple, as you say. You know, if somebody identifies as a woman, if they're transgender, they can compete against women who were born biologically, and, and then if not, then not. But then there are many who would argue who are not transphobes. There are many who, who are born biologically women who will say, but you have an unnatural advantage over me and that makes the sport unfair. How do, you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, there's lots of ways you can respond to that. So the first is the, the very language of you were born and I'm not biological somehow, like I don't think I'm a cyborg. So like this idea that like, oh, you're not a biological woman. Well, I am a woman, that's a fact. I am female, so all my identity records, my racing license, my medical records all say female, mm -hmm. right? And I'm pretty sure I made a biological stuff. So I'm a biological female mm -hmm. as well. So this question of do trans women have an advantage over cis women? We don't know. Um, in fact, there's basically no published research on this question. However, uh, there's good reason to think that there isn't, but I think it's irrelevant because we That's allow all kinds of competitive advantages within women's sport. So one example I'd love to talk about is the 2016 Rio Olympic women's high jump final. First place was over six foot three, tenth place was five foot five. So a 10 and a half inch height difference between first and 10th at the Olympics okay. in high jump. Right. And we call that fair. Okay. So the range of body types within the female category is way, way bigger than anything that could be attributed to trans women. Uh -huh. So if there's an advantage, and I'm not saying that there is for trans women in women's sport, it's not an unfair advantage. But also we've been competing at trying to compete at the highest level for decades. We've been allowed to compete for decades and no one has won an elite world championship. No one has won an Olympic gold medal. This Tokyo Olympics was the first time trans women even qualified for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So this idea that trans women are suddenly gonna take over women's sport is an irrational fear of trans women, which is the dictionary definition of transphobia. So uh, it's interesting that you say that, you know, because it's interesting that you say that because I think if, if I were to push back or, you know, even not even playing devil's advocates, uh, there, were, there are a few things that could be argued. Number one, you could argue that although the trans woman who competed in the Olympics didn't dominate, she did beat a field of women who might have qualified for that position, right? Um, secondly, when you talk about the height differences, I, I agree with this completely, but there, there are many who would argue that we exist in a state where a lot of the surgeries are new, a lot of the technology, just the technology is new. Transgenderism is not new. We know it throughout time, we've seen it throughout history. But there are many who would say, how do we ensure that we are creating some sort of standard? And the reason, the reason we talk to this, is, you know, we talk about this is, 
It's the reason they have to regulate, uh, regulate uh, performance-enhancing drugs, for instance. What is fair? What can you drink? What can you not drink? What can you consume? What can you not consume? Um, some would say, if you are born that way, that's how sport has determined who goes where. And then some would say, no, who, regardless of who you are, you should be able to compete. My question then comes in from a really, honestly, a different place. I look at somebody like Oscar Pistorius from South Africa, right? He was the double amputee. Yep. And Oscar Pistorius actually went, well, I want to compete in the able-bodied race, mm -hmm. right? And people were like, well, do you have an advantage? Do you not, et cetera, et cetera, because of the prosthetics. But then could there not be an argument if there is no advantage in that, that then trans women should be able to compete, but in the men's races then, because they'd still be able to compete in the sport. But they're women and they're female. So like I said, this boils down to, are trans women really women? Are they really female? Because if you think yes, then we belong competing with other women. Did you see it? You see what I'm talking about? Now, listen, I don't mean to suggest, because I certainly don't believe that I think people like Trevor Noah are about ready to reverse course, that they're going to convert to Christianity and have the Christian view. I don't think they're going to admit error. No, I don't think that's going to happen because there's way too much pride on the line. And I'm not sure they would even know how to reverse course at, at this point, even if they wanted to. I don't know how they would... I mean, the most extreme thing they could do is say, we were totally wrong, the Christians were totally right, and I'm going to join them. But even doing that, I think they know that's not going to change what they've done. You can't really watch that exchange, or if you're listening to it, listen to it, and not get the distinct impression that there is a budding awareness among progressives, at least this progressive, and I'm telling you it's extrapolated outwards from things that I've seen, that their rebellion against a cultural embrace of the Christian sexual ethic, which I'm not saying it was always a, in perfect form and this is always what society believed. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there exists the Christian sexual ethic over here and then people who believe we should be pushing towards that, that that should be the model. Even if we don't legislate that or codify that, that's the direction that we want to be going. And the left has warred against it. And I think that there is this budding awareness that their rebellion against that Christian sexual ethic has taken them down this path of self-contradiction and moral anarchy. And that's where they find themselves. They know that the ship that they're on the ship that they have christened, it is sinking. And they know that they are likely to go down with it. And yet, even though I think all of that, I also simultaneously feel equally confident that they will still prefer, many of them, the vast majority, will still prefer to plunge to the depths of moral insanity than ever admit that the right was right. Way too much pride goes before a fall, and I don't think they would ever admit that to be the case. Because in the minds of many of these progressive thought leaders, yes, even the comedians, in their minds, Christians are dunces. We're fools. They see us as, as a bunch of unenlightened ghouls who are obnoxiously committed to this old book of myths that have little to no bearing on the modern world. That's what they see. It's, it's what they believe. But that, believing that and peddling that about Christians, that becomes much more difficult, a much harder sell, given that so many of our predictions and prognostications about our cultural trajectory have proven to be accurate. For decades, for decades, we clueless buffoons who are Christians have been pointing this out. We've been saying, if God exists, and he does, but if God exists and there is a supreme being, a moral authority over the entire universe that spoke this universe into existence, if there is a God who exists, then he must consequently be the foundation of all science and logic and reason and morality. Those things would not exist if it wasn't for him. You see, once you have said there is a God, that God, by his very nature, 
will become the foundation of all of your science and your logic and your reason and your mathematics and your morality and all of that stuff. He is the base, the root of all of it. So consequently, when you war against that God, well, then you are necessarily rebelling against science, logic, reason, and morality. That's what's going to happen. And, and so many of us who are Christians have been saying that. It's one thing to say you don't want to worship God. I got it. It's one thing to say that you want to be the God of your own little universe. I understand what you're saying, okay? People love the darkness and they'll run towards the darkness. And I was there too. And many of those of you who are believers that are watching this, you've been there too. I get it. I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, if God exists, then there would be no science or logic or reason or morality without him. He animates and gives meaning to those fields. So if you rebel against the foundation of those things and you knock it out and pretend it's not there, then you have no basis for consistent science, logic, reason, or morality. It becomes simply a matter of opinion because you've destroyed the root system for that. That's what we've been saying. And yet, despite those warnings, the, the progressive left, the secular left, however you want to regard them, they have proudly, they have arrogantly discarded any public consciousness, consciousness of God's authority. They say any public recognition of God's authority that infringes on personal freedoms. And after a couple generations, where are we? A couple generations of rebellion to God, where are we? We are seeing that rebellion to God has turned into exactly what we said it was going to turn into. Natural consequence, naturally, consequentially, we are rebelling against science and logic and reason and morality. We rebelled against God and now where do we find ourselves? We are scientifically, we're, we're engaging these scientifically absurd and logically impaired and rationally defunct and morally offensive propositions where we are actually inviting people on TV and having a serious conversation with those who say men can get periods, with people who say men can have babies or that men are women. This is exactly what we said was coming. If there is no God, then there is no foundation for science or logic or reason or morality. And without any reason for those things, people will not abide by them. And they'll be doing things like this. Oh, men can have babies. What? That doesn't make any sense. Well, no, it doesn't. Because you have undermined the foundation for making sense in your culture. And yet despite that being as obvious as the nose on the end of your face and mine, progressives are so paralyzed by the apparent revelation that we Christians have been right, that they are not only no longer um, mocking flagrantly foolish propositions, like men can get their periods. They're no longer not doing, not just making fun of that stuff, but they're even turning the halls of comedy itself into these embarrassing spectacles of, of acquiescing to and showing fealty towards all of the foolishness. P making all of us abide by it too, or trying to. In other words, the same people that have spoken for years, they prattled on about, they patted each other on the back about speaking truth to power. They, they apparently haven't ever realized that they're the ones who are wielding power, but they now place alleged comedians like Trevor Noah on center stage to do their best tap dance routine around rationality. I mean, that's what I heard in that, in that clip. It's what I saw on Trevor, no Trevor Noah's face. He's out there just trying to avoid being canceled. That's all it is. Well, that's all it is, plus the awareness that they've really screwed this up. And I don't know that there's any going back. Here, here's how I described it before, and here's what they have done. The progressive left pulled up 
these moral guideposts for a happy, prosperous society. There were moral guideposts operate within these guideposts and, and the left came to believe that those moral guideposts were bigoted. When it comes to identity and marriage and sexuality and family, you shouldn't have those guideposts. Let people do what they want to do. Let people believe what they want to believe. So they came and they said it's bigoted and they pulled those guideposts out of the ground. And now we're living in an era where our slippery slope, well, no, it's turned into a free for all. It's a free, free fall all around us. And here's what the left is finding as everything is crashing down around them. Let use the snowball thing. Use the snowball thing. You've got um, a steep hill and a few snowballs have built up, but they're resting against one of those snow fences that are held in by these stakes. Those stakes, those are the moral guideposts and that netting, that's public morality. And here's what the progressive left did. They lifted up those moral guideposts and said that they're bigoted. We have no right to place them there. And so those snowballs that were being held by that fence of public morality, those snowballs began to carry them down the hill faster and faster and building and building. And now you've got a snowball that is three times as big as what that fence was. But you see the left now trying desperately as they've run down the hill to get in front of the snowball, they're trying to throw the guidepost back down in the ground and it isn't going to work. Snowball is going to just pile right over the top of it. Trevor Noah knows that. He can't place that guidepost down in front of that oncoming freight train, that oncoming snowball that looks like the giant ball from Indiana Jones. It's just going to barrel right over the top of him. He's going to get canceled. And when they try, to, the reason I say that he's going to get canceled, the moment they throw those moral stakes back down in the ground to try to stop it and say, okay, well, this is as far as we're going. Well, that would then make them the narrow-minded bigots. It would make men like uh, Trevor Noah as bad as some Christian conservative. And I'm telling you, people like Trevor Noah would rather die a million deaths than be the next J.K. Rowling. You saw what happened with J.K. Rowling. Oh, she was adored. She was embraced. She was a hero, a feminist, a pro-gay activist. But because she's a feminist and a pro-gay activist, J.K. Rowling said this transgender stuff is out of control. It doesn't make any sense. And it's literally erasing lesbians and women. That isn't right. A snowball had already rolled down the hill and J.K. Rowling tried to throw some new parameters in, throw those stakes back in, and she just got plowed over by it. And I think that's the, the budding awareness on the left is We've really screwed this up, but that doesn't stop there. It goes on to, and there's no effective way for us to stop it now. And so you see people like Trevor Noah clumsily hiding behind phrases like, well, some people say, or, if I could just play devil's advocate or others believe and on and on and on. I'll tell you what we're witnessing right now. What we are witnessing is a very unique, but it's a very obvious situation. You're seeing man-made religionists, people that believe in the, in the religion of humanity. They believe in the spirit of the age, that stuff. Man-made religionists, they despise the absolutes of Christianity. And yet time always, without exception, without fail, it proves how necessary those absolutes are to the orderly procedure of man in a fallen world, the orderly, orderly procedure of society. They're indispensable. And the left's realizing it, but they can never claim them. They can never go back to them. Number one, it would take too much pride. Number two, I don't even think it's possible at this point. You've opened up Pandora's box and there's no closing it. You're not going to stuff all of the bad stuff back in and close the lid. It's, it's done. It's done. Your thoughts welcome on that. Peter at PeterHeck.com. That's Peter at PeterHeck.com. Or you can just fill out the contact form over at PeterHeck.com. Would love it if you would do that. Would also love it if those of you who are, are free subscribers would want to stick around 
through the break. You just upgrade to paid. Give us a shot, $10 a month, or get the cheaper version, $100 a year. It saves you 20 bucks. Uh, and we'd love to have you part of the community. Give it a shot for a year. And if you do today, the next thing I want to talk about, the worst advice imaginable given to young people. Barack Obama just did it. That's coming up for paid subscribers right after the break. The rest of you, see you next week. The Memo with Peter Heck. Please patronize and thank all the sponsors of the Heck podcast, including McGonagall's Buick GMC, Terrell's Auto Service, Norris Insurance, Stevens Machine, Creative Financial Center, Indiana Right to Life, Trigreen Tractor, The Indiana Family Institute, Hartman Family Farms, Liberty Financial Group, The Wyman Group, and J. Watson Creations.